and see what he can do in the midst of unbelievers, on the leading edge with his word, his power, his grace, and his mercy. For God's sakes, we're Lutheran. This is what we know. Wittenberg Project, like, comment, subscribe. Yo, I saw this beautiful video posted by Anthony Bradley that conveyed the love and trust of a father and son. You ready? Yeah. You sure? All right, let's do this yeah. thing. Yeah. Handsome, right, buddy? But are we going to take this thing off and then do it with the soft pop? This pop? Yeah, you want to feel it? Yeah. Feel it. <laughs> no. See, it's not hard. Okay. Okay? You don't trust me now? You trust me? I do trust you. You do? Why you trust me? Because I love you. <laughs> I love you too, buddy. It made me think about the love and trust that we should have in our Father, our Heavenly Father. A word that I learned from Rod Rosenblatt is fiducia, which is a different language, you know what I'm talking about. But it conveys the love, trust, and confidence that we should have in God and His Word, but let's to keep it on God, our Father. It's a beautiful video, like we, it's not easy, but we, we have to love, but the reason why we love it is because He loved us first. Love is a hard topic to discuss. Um, I'm going to show this sermon by Pastor Delwyn Campbell from Gary, Indiana. Um, a link to his uh, Twitter, I mean his uh, YouTube, be in the comments. It's a sermon where he touches on God's love for us and how it's a beautiful thing. Like He came for us while we were sinners and things of that nature. And it covers just the overall concept of it. I mean, I do think that it's slept on that, the love and trust that we should have in his word. It's not easy to follow, but we trust and we know that. Like this, the kid, he was literally scared. Like, yo, man, use that soft part. Play, <laughs> use that soft part. Yo, do you trust me? It's something that we always we have to face when it comes to God's word. Like, do we trust him? Truth be told, a lot of times we don't. We go against his will and his word. But should we trust him? Yes. His best is at hand for us. Anyhow, here's a sermon by Pastor Delwyn. Like, comment, subscribe, with him a project. Hope you guys like it. What love is? John wrote about a lot about the subject of love in his gospel and his epistles. Today, we want to talk about that. But first, a gentleman who was a professed Christian was taken seriously ill. He became troubled about the little love he felt in his heart for God and spoke of his experience to a friend. This is how the friend answered him. When I go home from here, I expect to take my baby on my knee, look into her sweet eyes, listen to her charming prattle, and tired as I am, her presence will rest me. For I love that child with unutterable tenderness, but she loves me little. If my heart were breaking, it would not disturb her sleep. If my body were racked with pain, it would not interrupt her play. If I were dead, she might forget me in a few days. Besides this, she had never brought me a penny, but was a constant expense to me. I am not rich, but there is not money enough in the world to buy my baby. How is this? Does she love me or do I love her? Do I withhold my love until I know she loves me? Am I waiting for her to do something worthy of my love before extending it? This practical illustration of the love of God for his children caused tears to roll down the sick man's face. Oh, I see, he exclaimed. It is not my love to God, but God's love for me that I should be thinking of. And I do love him now as I never loved him before. Bow your heads with me. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn and take them to heart, that by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we might embrace and ever hold fast 
the blessed hope of everlasting life through Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Love, a word that comes and goes. But few people really know what it means to really love somebody. Love, though the tears may fade away, I'm so glad your love would stay because I love you and you show me, Jesus, what it really means to love. Those lyrics from a song written by Kirk Franklin titled Love for his first fourth album. It was a collaboration project with the group uh, New Nation in 1997. Most of you probably remember that album for the song Stop. Yeah, that was a nice cut. You could skate off it, you could bounce to it, you could wash your car to it. But I always liked this song. It just stuck with me. It was one of my favorites, in fact. And in this song, Kirk drives home the unrelenting, ever persevering, unfailing love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because so many people do not really understand God's love. They do not understand the love that God has for us, nor do they fully understand how to love either God or their neighbor. First Thessalonians gives us an example of what love looks like. In the first chapter, the fourth and fifth verses, Paul writes, for we know brothers loved by God that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you, not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in full conviction. You know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. That's love. The gospel of Jesus Christ is love declared to you. Love lived out by God before men. Love experienced, love tasted and seen. Love transforming, so strong, so, so relentless, so ever persevering that he's not influenced by your response to it. He sends his gospel, not in words only, but also in his presence. And not just for you to know about it, but for you to live in it. First John 4 and 10 tells us, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. I know that is a big word, but it just simply means he's the place where God meets you to cover your sins. He's the place where God meets you to take them away, to cleanse you, to make you pure in his sight. And our gospel text comes from John, the same apostle that wrote that verse, and it, Jesus tells us what our relationship with God is like. John 14, 15 through 21, if you love me, you will keep my commandments and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you yet a little while and the world will see me no more but you will see me because i live you also will live in that day you will know that i am in my father and you in me and i in you whoever has my commandments and keeps them he it is who loves me and he who loves me will be loved by my father and i will love him and manifest myself to him. Amen. Now, on the surface, that sounds like Jesus is saying that God will stand back like we do, wait for evidence that we love him like we do, and then respond in kind. Go ahead and say it, like we do. <laughs> and that's how we tend to think of love, but in reality, that isn't love, saints. That's 
reciprocity. See, the practice of exchanging things with others for mutual benefit, especially privileges granted by one country or organization to another, or in this case, by God to the people who obey him, who, quote, love him. That, that's what we think of love is, being. That, that's how we think love works in the world. I love you because you showed me love. I give you love because you gave me love. Except the Bible tells us that God doesn't deal like that. 1 John 4, 19 says, we love because he first loved us. Not just as some scribes added, we love him or we love God. You might find that in your King James Bible, for example. But the reality is actually far deeper. The only reason that we love at all our spouse, our children, our neighbors, our enemies, God himself, is because he first loved us. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28 tells us, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. Think about that for a second. And God blessed them. Then the text goes on and says, And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over every living thing that moves on the earth. But again, think about that. Whatever you're going through right now, whether it's good, it's bad, or even indifferent, you are here going through that, feeling what you're feeling, experiencing what you're experiencing because God did that. You see, when God made man, he didn't just speak us into existence as powerful as that is. Oh yeah, that is powerful because what God speaks is. It isn't maybe, it isn't could be, it is. It's powerful that God, contemplating his own sacrificial death for us, for example, could take bread, give it to his disciples and say, this is my body given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Jesus gave of himself for us. He didn't need to become to be bread for himself. He didn't need to be contained in a cup for himself. That was for you. But that's another sermon. <laughs> what I'm saying right now is that God did more than that. God made us in his image after his likeness. God gave man dominion over his creation, over every living thing, and God blessed them. Don't just fly by those words to get to the fruitful and multiply part, as enjoyable as some of us find that. Linger for a moment that God blessed them. Man came into being with a blessing. Mm -hmm. See, their initial experience of life was that it was a blessing. First John 4, 15 through 17 tells us, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. Wouldn't you like to have confidence in the day of judgment? People work hard to try to find a source for confidence in the day of judgment. Others try to ignore the possibility of the day of judgment. 
But the Bible tells us there is a way to have confidence in him. Because he made us for that. He made us to live a life in a state of blessing. In fact, it took sin to make life a curse. It's because of sin that we don't know God. It's because of sin that we walk in fear of God, of one another, of God's creation, and even of ourselves. We fear our weakness. We fear our strength. We fear our potential. We, we could be so much, but settle for so little because of fear. We cheat ourselves out of the joy that we could have as God's beloved children because of fear. But the Bible says there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. See, fear leads us to disobey Christ's commandments. We fear that we will be hurt or we will suffer loss. And God knows he suffered because he loved us. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 3, now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? Ah, if it only stopped there. But even if you should suffer for righteousness, you will be blessed. Yes, saints, even if you should suffer. Because first of all, whatever suffering you may be going through is what the Bible calls a light momentary affliction, not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. And secondly, you will be blessed because God sees you. And so therefore, have no fear of them, those who cause you to suffer, those who are your haters, those who try to stand in your way, those who try to trip you up. Don't be afraid of them, neither be troubled. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. The reality is you will suffer in this life one day or another, one way or another, suffering will come to you. Whether you do good or bad, sometimes the sun will shine and sometimes the rain will fall. I think it's shining right now, but when I came out this morning, it was raining. If I'd have took, if taken that rain to be the declaration of who I am and what I am, I would say, I am of all men most miserable as I stand here getting soaked to the bone. Instead of getting in my car, getting in my car, driving to this church, staying out of the rain, by the time we leave here, the sun is shining. Praise God. <laughs> but that is reality. Christ also suffered once for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. He did that. He experienced that for you because he loves you. God loves us enough to forgive us our sins. It's not on a whim. It's not simply by speaking a word, but by suffering and dying for them. God loves us enough to engage us, engage with us, to get his hands dirty for us. Genesis 2 and 7 says, then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living creature. Romans 5 and 8 says, but God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, someone asked me, why? Why do you talk so much about Christ and him crucified? Why don't you spend more time talking about him coming out of the tomb, him healing the sick, him doing all kind of wonderful signs? Why do you talk so much about the cross? Well, it's because you need to know right now that God loves you. Maybe especially right now as you sit in your home, perhaps as you sit by yourself, in a senior citizen's home, 
Maybe as you sit by yourself in a hospital room, you need to know God loves you. He loves you enough to live with you and live in you. He loves you enough to suffer with you, to bleed for you, to die for you, to rise for you, and to return for you. And he's not left you without comfort. The Holy Spirit is another comforter. He's available to you, promised by God, given in holy baptism as the down payment of your inheritance that was stolen by sin. The devil tries to cheat you of what is yours by deceiving you into thinking that you are not loved by God. That's a lie. The devil tries to cheat you by telling you that there is no God that you were not created, that there is nothing special about you or your existence. That is a lie. The devil tries to cheat you by making you think that death has the final say. That is a lie. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Hallelujah. And he still loves you. His commandments are still for your good. The love that he has for you and works through you is still good. Good for you, good for your family, good for your neighbor, good for your community, and good for this world. John 14, 18 through 21 says, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. And in that day, you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. Saints, we are not alone. You're not alone. Wherever you are right now, whatever it looks like right now, you are not alone, whether you're seating six feet apart or shut up, sitting up like Brandy says, Sitting up in my room, passing time thinking of you. You're not alone. You're part of the communion of saints. You can look forward to the resurrection of the body. When this mortal body puts on that immortal body. When this corrupt body puts on that glorious body. When death is swallowed up in victory, you can look forward to that because Jesus lives. We are family saints. We're part of the communion of saints. We look forward to the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. And so therefore, we rest in hope, knowing that as he is, so are we in this world. He is love, and so are we in this world. He is your peace, and so are we in this world. He is sufficient for all things, and saints, don't let the physical numbers fool you. So are we in this world. Look at it this way. How many people were there to see Jesus risen from the dead that Easter morning? It wasn't a lot. It didn't take a lot for him to raise. It didn't take a lot of people to see him for it to be true. It just took one woman to have a conversation, one woman to run back to the room and tell the brethren, one woman who could get past the tears on her face to see a smile that looked out of place from a man who seemed to be the gardener, but in actuality was the garden maker. One woman did all that. And if one woman can do all that, think what you can do six feet apart. Think what you can do just 10 in a room or maybe 25 tomorrow. Think what you can do when you stop being afraid of love and start embracing love, think what you can do if you just live out who he is living in you. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. 
Oh, I guess I better stop now. <laughs> so let the peace of God that passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, amen, amen.